Okay, we're gonna get things rolling here. Um, my name is Tom Suter, and I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. Welcome to ATARC's Thursday After a Lunch IT webinar series. This week we have, um, in honor of Veterans Day, we're gonna go ahead and do it on a Tuesday. So we've got a little change there. Um, today we're gonna hear about federal IT leaders as they discuss the need to strengthen artificial intelligence ca capabilities uh, particularly at the edge and particularly as a result of all the things that we've gone through here with COVID-19. Um, welcome to all the attendees. Uh, thank you for taking your time out of your day. Um, and a special thanks to Jack Soslowski, uh, Jeff Winterich, Ryan Krause, Matt Atkins. And uh, this has been a real collaboration with a lot of different players from the industry side. Kerasoft is a great distributed partner, Red Hat, uh, H. Hewlett Packard Enterprise and NVIDIA. Uh, this, so this afternoon, you're gonna hear from our panelists. We're gonna have some Q&A. We may pop in a poll question and then try to answer your questions. And uh, we have a big panel today. So I'm gonna forego uh, opening monologue statements. And if everybody can come on, all my panelists um, can come on with audio and video. I'll do some quick intros before we get into the discussion. I will start off, and of course, I never know how everybody's Hollywood Squares look, so I'm gonna go off my list. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Vinu Varma. Uh, she's a procurement analyst, uh, Office of Acquisitions at the NIH, uh, inside of the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. How are you doing today, Vinu? Thank you, uh, yes, uh, I'm doing well. And um, I'm busy and I'm Vinu Verma. I am also a document generation system lead in addition to being a procurement analyst. And I manage um, DGS, that is a document generation system. And it is a solicitation and contract uh, system for all oh, NIH. Not to interrupt, I'm gonna go ahead and just introduce everybody real quick and then we'll, I will start right off with you. But I wanna get, okay. to, I wanna get everybody please introduced. Okay. Um, and I know you've been really busy over there at NIH, uh, particularly this year. Uh, you and your colleagues. Uh, next up, I, uh, Jimmy Sims. And Jimmy Sims is a senior physical scientist um, and senior advisor for AI at NOAA. And uh, how are you doing today, Jimmy? So I think you're on mute. I'm doing great, Tom. Thank you for inviting Good. me. Good. And you're in the DC area? Yes, I am. Fantastic. Fantastic. And next up, we have with us uh, Colonel Kristen Sailing, Chief Analytics Officer at the Army Talent Management Task Force. And she's been, um, she's done a few of these with us. I love your set there, Kristen. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. It's, uh, it's definitely been comfortable and I, I don't miss my, uh, my commute into the Pentagon. Yep. And uh, we also have with us Elham uh, Tabasi, Chief of Staff, Information Technology Laboratory at the National Institute for Standards and Technology. And uh, how are you doing today, Elham? I'm doing, I'm doing fine. Thank you so very much. Many thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk with you, panelists and the audience. Yep, yep. And you are, are you in the Washington, D.C. area, I assume, in Maryland somewhere? Just guessing? Yes, yes, yes. This is in Gatorsburg, Maryland, and I live in Potomac, Maryland. So Fantastic. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, next, we have uh, Christos Macridis, uh, who's a senior advisor for the uh, United States Department of Veteran Affairs and also has a double up job of the National Artificial Intelligence Institute. How are you doing today, Christos? Hi, everybody. Yes, yeah, so I serve on the National AI Institute and uh, delighted to, to join and uh, participate in the conversation. Yep. Thank you for making the time today. And um, from the industry, our industry partners, we have Jeff Winterich. Uh, he's a DOD account uh, chief technologist at uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. How are you doing today, Jeff? Is that building, is that the one in Herndon? Uh, no, that's our new headquarters in San Jose. Oh, wow. Okay. And where are you out of today? I am out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, we also have with us uh, Ryan Krause, who's a staff solutions architect at Red Hat. How are you doing today, Ryan? Doing great. Uh, excited to be here, and yeah, it was a really good panel. And so honored to be uh, included on the list here. <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, where do you where do you hail from? Um, I'm actually out of the Atlanta, Georgia area. Oh wow. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, 
And also we have Matt Atkins, who's OEM Solutions, uh, Software Solutions over at NVIDIA. How are you today, Matt? You're on mute, Matt. Hey, sorry, thanks for having me on. Yep, yeah, doing well. Down in Charlotte, North Carolina, former yeah, DCer -er, though. Yeah, we've got the, the, the Mid-Atlantic covered. That's good. <laughs> um, and don't worry about the mute thing. I went on one webinar for about three minutes and I didn't realize I was on mute. So a couple seconds here isn't gonna kill anybody. Okay, well, we're gonna get right at it. We're gonna actually uh, circle back to where we started with the new and um, hear what's going on in the acquisition area inside of NIH. Thank you, Benu. And you're on mute. Okay, yeah. there you go. All right, thank you, Tom. So um, I'm a document generation system team lead and this system is for um, solicitation and contract generation for NIH. And uh, this is a legacy system. So what we are looking, we have MITRE on board. They are conducting DGS assessment. And uh, that is one of our initiative is looking into um, technologies and leveraging AI in this process of enhancement or replacing DGS. So that is um, very important and critical for us to get industry perspective uh, in our initiative and have a collaborative effort between federal and industry government. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I got to get a little get, got to get a little quicker at the trigger there. Um, next up, we'll go with uh, Jamis Sims. Hi, good afternoon again, uh, Jimmy Sims, and I do serve as the NOAA Senior Science Advisor for Artificial Intelligence. And it always brings me great excitement to talk about what we're doing uh, in NOAA in regards to advancing science and technology. Of course, our main mission is to save lives and property. And within NOAA, we actually provide environmental modeling, forecast, and predictions for everything from the bottom of the ocean floor to the sun. And so with that, of course, we collect um, a lot of, of data on a daily basis. And artificial intelligence is certainly allowing us to better manage that data across all of our science mission areas. And so there are many examples of how we apply artificial intelligence within the organization. Um, and we are looking to grow that with our AI strategy and implementation plan. Additionally, we are developing new partnerships. We have uh, many partnerships already with academia and private industry, um, but we also have some newly developing uh, partnerships as well that will further advance um, our mission in the use of artificial intelligence. And so um, I'm happy to, to talk more with you all about those. Yes, thank you for coming today. And uh, next up, I will go with Elam. And Elam, I remember uh, it was about a year ago when before pandemic, it seems like 10 years ago, when NIST had that initiative um, <clears throat> based on the executive order from the president on artificial intelligence. And uh, boy, you all did a great job in very short order. Uh, everybody met in Gaithersburg at NIST and you just were bam, 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 and, and came out with some great outputs there. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you very much for that. Yeah, fun times, uh, uh, good times. Uh, we, are, we are continuing our work on, on AI. So um, uh, uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm part of NIST. Uh, for uh, people that don't know NIST, NIST uh, is a home to five Nobel Prize winner. We have a broad portfolio of research from um, material science to bioengineering, smart manufacturing, and of course, artificial intelligence is one of the strategic priority at NIST. I'm part of the Information Technology Laboratory, when we do a lot of work in cybersecurity, privacy. Uh, you probably are familiar with cybersecurity framework, uh, privacy framework, and also a lot of work in um, mathematical modeling and uh, identity management. ITL cultivates trust in IT and metrology uh, by advancing measurement and, and testing and evaluations. And on our staff, we have computer scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, system engineers, but also psychologists and uh, cognitive scientists. In the area of AI, uh, NIST develops tools to measure and understand the capabilities and limitations of artificial intelligence technologies. We work with the AI community, industry, academia, and other federal agencies, basically uh, the whole world, to establish the technical requirements needed to cultivate the trust that AI systems are accurate, reliable, safe, secure, explainable, and free from bias. Um, you mentioned the um, 
the plan that we published last year in the response to executive order uh, that was a plan for federal engagement in development of technical standards for AI. So we work with the whole technical community, not only to advance development of standards, but also to develop the uh, a sound scientific foundation for the development of technically sound standards. The whole goal is to ensure design, develop, acquire, and use of AI is in a manner that foster public trust and confidence while protecting privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. Thank you so much for that. And next we'll go to uh, Colonel Sailing. Uh, you've been working on workforce and hiring and, oh yeah, there's this little thing where we can't see anybody anymore and we have to hire remotely and, and we've totally upended our business. Other than that, it hasn't been an interesting nine months for you or eight months. Oh yes, it's been, uh, it's been interesting and busy and we're going through a little bit of a digital modernization renaissance as we are moving people out of the Pentagon. We're not sitting in our conference rooms with our printed slides. Everybody's using digital collaboration tools and our senior leaders are getting very used to having dashboards display information to them in real time. And they, of course, they want more. We, you know, anytime you see this, you wanna have some more cowbell. So we've gotten a lot of uh, impetus behind our efforts. And I'd say they're, right now they're kind of two-pronged. We're still working on a lot of the projects that I think we talked about the last time where we are using artificial intelligence and machine learning to model our churn behavior, our acquisition behavior, and a number of other different behaviors and proclivities throughout the Army. Um, but we're now starting to get into more of the predictive realm when it comes to regular talent management processes. Uh, right now I'm in the process of fielding a machine learning model that uh, we're calling the retention prediction model army. It generates a prediction vector for each individual in the army and we do go down to the individual level and it's total active army. We haven't quite figured out the nuances of our reserve components yet, but uh, we're trying to get that rolled out and then along with a lot of the other um, kind of visible modernization efforts you've seen from Army Futures Command from the Army AI Center and our partnership with the Jake. Um, you know, seeing a lot on project convergence and their Coyus environment and the, um, the joint federated platform that the Jake is putting together. We've realized we have to start investing in the talent that we need in order to sustain and then further these modernizations. So it's kind of the ultimate, um, uh, the ultimate Ouroboros where we are generating these capabilities to assess the talent that we're bringing in to generate more of these capabilities. So it, it's pretty exciting. Great, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Christos, I think you have some slides to share with us too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at the National AI Institute, we're really trying to build upon uh, one of the core competencies within the VA, which is that our data is some of the most comprehensive, arguably the most comprehensive medical record system in the United States. And so we're working to take that data uh, and then uh, bring in academics, uh, work with private sector uh, and, uh, and all the local VA medical centers. Uh, but to do, to actually uh, leverage uh, that data, sometimes it requires pioneering new uh, research agreements, uh, CRADAs, for example, that allow you to de-identify data and then uh, transfer it over so that uh, privacy is retained. And so uh, in case people are wondering why, why are we focusing on, on data when this is about AI, uh, I, I'm, a, lot, a lot of the benefits of AI come when you only have a large data set. And so uh, that's really what we've been trying to drill down to. Um, so the, the first uh, thing that we've been uh, building upon is the fact that the VA has all these different medical centers across cities in the United States. And so we recently um, did a memorandum of understanding with the Washington DC VA, where we built out um, a dashboard for clinicians uh, so that they could develop and uh, apply uh, better treatment to their patients uh, over the coronavirus. And so I'm just going to share a, a tiny bit um, uh, of what we've been uh, doing here. Uh, so this is, uh, let me put it on a slide, uh, slide show. So here are all the medical centers that we've been uh, working with, and it's just weighted by uh, size, which is the, the, size of the, uh, the size of the circle gives you the number of individuals in the medical center. Um, and so what we've essentially been able to do is create a mortality risk score using some different AI methods. 
uh, XG Boost is one of the ones that's performing best. And so we take demographic data about an individual. And so, I mean, obviously for purposes here, we're redacting the, some of the, this information, but the clinician will be able to see that and then they'll be able to see a mortality risk score. And then so that it's explainable, we also enumerate the different uh, features that are most important. And that allows the clinician, instead of just having a single score, they can see what are the inputs to that and then make uh, adjustments appropriately. And then lastly, really quickly, the second um, area we've really been building upon is working with academics. Um, we've got a couple of research papers that uh, are informing the operational uh, uh, work that we're doing. So, for example, around mental health, uh, we have a paper that's about decomposing the different factors that affect mental health. And long story short, we find that how people are doing at work, i.e. whether or not they're using their skills at work, whether or not they have financial anxiety, that's the most predictive uh, set of characteristics for mental health. So with that, um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Tom. Thank you, Christos. Uh, next up, we'll go with uh, Ryan Krauss. Ryan. Hey, um, yeah, so my, um, really the work that we've been focusing on at Red Hat um, is uh, trying to establish how the processes and technology by which uh, machine learning and AI is done. Um, you know, a little peek behind the curtains for all of our participants. Um, yesterday, we were on a prep call for this, uh, this webinar and everyone kept saying like, oh, well, the technology platform is easy. And then it came my turn and I was like, oh, well, I'm the technology platform guys, you all are picking on me. But um, in reality, you know, <clears throat> it is easy to build a technology platform. What's hard is building a technology platform that is ubiquitous for your teams and, you know, doesn't uh, limit your capability and flexibility in the future. And that's really at Red Hat, um, you know, what we've been working with HP and NVIDIA and specializing in. Um, sort of our job as an industry partner is to stay a half step ahead of our customers and to be able to you know, bridge the gap between different organizations and figure out you know, what are the trends and where are people heading and you know, what are the solutions they're using. So we can use that to you know, architect something that will solve the problems that you're going to have six months from now, but not, you know, you know so you're not limited today. Um, and, you know, I have a background. I, I started as an aerospace engineer. Um, then I went on to uh, eventually manage an HPC cluster, and now I'm here at Red Hat working with Kubernetes and cloud and data science and all that fun stuff that we play with here. But, um, you know, really, so I've, I've gotten kind of a unique background of like starting off as a scientist, doing the scientific workloads, writing the methods, and then running, you know, one type of architecture and now, you know, switching over to another. So it's kind of been an interesting position to kind of see how all of these different pieces can fit in and the different problems they can solve. So. Great, thank you, thank you, Ryan. Um, next, we'll go to Jeff. Thanks, Tom. So, uh, one of the things I do here at HPE is I'm an AI ambassador, and I try to, uh, you know, bring solutions that are relevant and and um, and operate in this case at the edge, right? So, one of the things we've been working on that that Ryan alluded to, along with Nvidia, is a year and a half ago, we debuted a a very small toolkit, if you will. It's about nine by nine by seventeen, fits an air, airline carry-on overhead that enables multiple AI workloads, enables DevOps, and, and is built on containers and, and allows that ubiquitous platform, right? And, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to talk with the, you know, the, the CIO of the federal government at one point and participate on the cloud, the transition from cloud first to cloud smart. So what this really means is that platforms do matter Right, and the platform that we're talking about, that we're not really showing, but we're kind of alluding to, right, has security built in at, 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 in at the grassroots. It's containerized, right, supports multiple AI workloads. It's GPU accelerated, so you almost get a supercomputer in a toolbox. So what we're trying to do is really get the word out that now we can really consume that data at the edge, run those AI and analytic models and machine learning at the edge, which we've started to get to crawl to that point and it's really exciting because now we can really say with a straight face that almost any workload could be tackled at the point of origin. So that's, you know, I'm a legacy HPC guy. So I'd love to talk about that kind of stuff because, you know, putting the workload to action at that point and reducing delays and all those good things and saving lives is why we're here. Thank you. 
Uh, and last, but certainly not least, uh, Matt Akins. Uh, I think you're still on mute, Matt. But uh, yeah, I, I've, I've gone to your conferences. It seems like NVIDIA has just uh, been been blowing up. You guys have been buying a lot of different different companies, and you know you're leading with AI. Um, been leading AI since you've been entered the federal government. Yeah, so I think everybody knows NVIDIA from the AI space and, and sort of why we're relevant in the industry. We're, we're a market leader in, compar in parallel computing and GPUs, and I think that's what we're most known for. But if you if you do attend the GTC conferences and if you, if you have an empty enough schedule to listen to Jensen speak, um, you'll notice that that's a very small percentage of what he actually talks about. And we're very much shif shifting into a, a full data center company uh, with the acquisition of Mellanox. Um, we're, we're much more highly focused on multi-node orchestration. Um, we're also more focused on software. So not only do we produce sort of the underlying enablement uh, GPUs to, to make these supercomputers possible, but we also play around with them. Uh, and we also create uh, data training models um, and, you know, and we try to make them in a fashion that makes them uh, easily redeployed for other customers. Uh, so to that end, we've created a, a repository for lack of a better term, but um, it's what we're calling NGC NVIDIA GPU Cloud. Uh, there are containers, pre-built models, um, do, toolkits for building your own, um, all that sort of thing, all things you need to, to get your AI journey going, um, whatever your uh, platform may be. And we've been working tightly with Red Hat and HPE to, you know, edge computing, uh, AI edge is, is great, but you still need a traditional data center and you still need to connect all those dots. So that's exactly what we've been building. And we have capabilities starting with Apollo line all the way to the edge um, and the small form factor, which I, I, I think was more directly marketed towards the government, which you may be familiar with. Um, but we, we easily use OpenShift to be able to port those containers, build them back in your data center and then move them securely out to the edge, uh, whether it be remote workers or even in its own instantiation, so. Great, thank you for that. I'm gonna, actually, I wanna go to the poll question first because it was like kind of married to the first question I had for everybody. Alyssa, if you can put the first poll question up that everybody can answer. Uh, by the way, get your question. We're about to head in Q&A, so when you, at any time, please ask that. Uh, is edge computing an upcoming initiative for your agency? Yes, no, I don't know. And what percentage of your agency's data is processed at the edge today? And are you currently using artificial intelligence or machine learning solutions at your agency? So we've got three quick ones. It won't take us long to get through this, but um, it'll set the stage for my first couple of questions. I think, uh, Everybody has had a chance to respond. Okay, let's close her up, Alyssa. Okay. Um, interesting. Um, first question, interesting. Second question, wow. A lot of agency data process at the edge. I was, that's probably a little higher than I would have thought. Um, okay. Um, so uh, maybe we can make this like a two-part answer for everybody. We, we just saw the results uh, from the general population. Maybe starting with uh, you, Vinu, uh, how is, how, what's the state of AI at your agency, gen generally speaking? And do those numbers match up to what you've seen in your experience? Right. So what I think that's a very, what I can talk to you about more acquisition related, and then we have ERE that is grant system. So it is still in a starting stage. Uh, it is, um, I guess, uh, I believe all program offices, they are looking into it and they, they want more information about AI. And another important factor, what I understand is we need more AI experts within the federal government. And that is very important for us to evaluate whether it is, uh, you know, a true AI. Sometimes you get certain systems and you look at the demos 
and we can tell it's like seriously are we looking at you know what we are looking for so that that is also very important to have ai experts within the federal government and um, and uh, be really looking forward to collaborate with industry to um, get better results. And due to COVID, I believe uh, this is a priority now. Great, great. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll move over to, to Krista. So, uh, you know, you're at the VA, it's, there's a lot of data being accumulated there. Uh, what has been generally the reception to these AI, AI efforts and, and uh, especially with the culture and, 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 you know, people are used to doing same things their own way. How, how has that been for you all there in your journey over there at the VA? Yeah, I think I have two main thoughts. One is um, around technology governance and how agencies can vary in their degree of centralization or decentralization. So in the VA, there is an element that, of course, is centralized, but then because there are all these different uh, local VA medical centers, it becomes decentralized. And so each medical center, while, while they adhere to certain processes, they also do things a little bit differently. And so in that sense, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's not super, like edge computing is something that I'm, I don't think that we're, we're doing. Um, they're, they're, we are using AI. I mean, the example that we gave um, with this uh, dashboard that, that is being piloted, um, there's other applications of AI. Um, we're working with some other researchers around taking, uh, for example, uh, wearable sort of data um, and, and how one can use that to understand people's uh, well-being better uh, because you don't want to just look at uh, physical metrics, i.e. blood pressure. You also want to understand somebody's state of mind. And so uh, we're, we are applying uh, the, these sort of techniques to ask those big questions. Um, but I, I, my, my understanding is that it's, it's just really tricky to inject some of these methods in when you've got all these kind of different layers. And so it does go sometimes slowly. And also there is, because the uh, public sector is a steward to, um, to citizens, there is a little bit more caution in applying this, uh, particularly when you're working with um, PII. And so um, there, there is, I think, warrant behind some of the caution. So it's like, you don't wanna, you don't wanna move too fast, but you don't wanna move too slow. And so I think where the NI, we're really trying to um, find the sweet spot is by bringing um, private sector, higher ed, um, like individuals into the fold uh, through the sort of research that we pioneer through what we call like these AI tech sprints. Um, and I can go into that more later, but I don't want to uh, blabber too long. Um, but we are trying to strike that middle ground. Um, but it's a, it's a very tough balance. You, you don't want to go too fast and uh, um, make yourself too vulnerable. Right. And Jamise, I, I, I know at NOAA, you have all these uh, folks that are really doctors, you know, scientists and uh, is the challenge, I know there's always been a challenge of everybody's kind of doing their own thing. So they're spending a lot of their time in the setup of these uh, labs. And, and have you guys really been able to offer some of the services so they can spend more of their time analyzing data? I mean, how, how has it been over there? And no, I don't want to try to characterize it for you. Right, so I can speak to how we're applying AI in general and give some more specific examples. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we've been using artificial intelligence uh, for over 25 years now, um, particularly beginning with numerical weather prediction and data assimilation, as well as parameterizing models uh, for weather forecast guidance and also data processing. Um, where we're really seeing the advantage of AI is of course in reducing the compute cost. Um, we've seen in our fisheries office, we're using artificial intelligence um, to analyze data from uh, fishery surveys has actually reduced the compute time by 98% um, for data processing. Additionally, as I mentioned, you know, we're using artificial intelligence to improve upon um, our weather forecast models and, and guidance. Um, and so what we're doing is um, we've done a data call actually to determine how many projects do we have within NOAA that use some form of artificial intelligence 
and we've identified approximately 190 uh, projects across the agency. And so that just shows you how we have been, um, we, we like to call ourselves and we are, you know, global, global leaders um, in applying artificial intelligence uh, for environmental modeling. Um, and so, you know, we partner with academic uh, institutions. We too want to make sure that um, the future of, of AI includes um, the best and the brightest. And so through offering uh, internship opportunities as well as other uh, project collaborations with academia, you know, we're able to tap into uh, new talent that may be graduating soon and can come and work for us. Um, additionally, we have new partnerships that are developing. Uh, we recently partnered with Google um, for a, a three-year contract to leverage expertise, you know, both from our agency and also as expertise from Google um, in order to uh, further advance our artificial intelligence uh, applications. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that within NOAA, this year we have released, um, we finalized and released uh, five science and technology strategies and our citizen science uh, strategy is also being finalized. But the other five include uncreated systems, uh, omics, um, as well as cloud and data. And so with those strategies, you know, we're seeing a lot of synergy across um, our science and technology focus areas. And artificial intelligence can be applied, you know, to each of these uh, science um, and, and technology areas. And so, you know, we're really pushing it forward uh, to make sure that we're able to um, really meet our goals and our mission within the agency. Yeah, there's probably not too many programs you have that wouldn't, you know, use artificial intelligence, you know, have the use artificial intelligence to its advantage. Thank you for that, Jamis. And um, we'll go over back to you, uh, Colonel Sailing. Uh, the Army, and you're on mute, I think, still. Yeah, in the Army, uh, you've got a CDO. You've had a CDO. What Tom's been there about a year. It's it seems like you've been developing communities around artificial intelligence. But uh, go go ahead and let us know where you got where you all are at this point. Well, we actually just uh, appointed a new CDO. Um, he's both Chief Data Officer, Chief Analytics Off Officer, Dr. Dave Markowitz. Um, so we're, we're kind of getting everything realigned underneath his vision in cooperation with the CIO's office and trying to figure out kind of how those roles and responsibilities are going to work for us. Um, we're, we're trying to figure out where the Army sits in terms of different roles and responsibilities because we've got some of our operational units looking at hiring chief technical officers to advise them to go on and just we're trying to figure out where the roles um, hit the right level of synergy. But when it comes to where we are on AI, I mean, we are we are all over the map. We have things going on in terms of sensor to shooter and wearable technology that are really kind of pushing the edge. And then we have organizations that are still kind of working at the at the you know acetate over maps level in their command centers who really want to be able to innovate into the space but aren't quite sure where to start. So what we're trying to do is figure out how to take the expertise that we have distributed at labs and at some you know operational headquarters throughout the army and reach out to these folks who are innovating from the bottom up and kind of meet them in the middle. So we have a number of different projects that um, we're looking to support for that. We have Project Ridgeway coming out of the 18th Airborne Corps and the 82nd at Fort Bragg, where they're looking at becoming completely an AI ready division. We're still kind of working through the pieces of that, but there's, it's, we're talking about how they can improve everything from automating their regular business practices as a headquarters to taking some of this technology and making it work at the operational level. Um, I, I think there isn't, you know, we're talking about an enterprise that's 1.2 million people. When you consider all our components and our civilian yeah. workforce, there's not going to be a one size fits all. So we're trying sure. to break ourselves out of our usual kind of bureaucratic scripted, here is the doctrinal answer on how we're going to do that and figure out what is a more flexible framework for innovation and the provision of resources look like for us. It is um, just, it's pretty innovative in the direction that we've been able to go with this, but it's also uncharted territory. So. Yeah, that kind of makes it great. Exciting. Yeah, and I, I forgot Tom to say, well, he's over at the Navy now. I, I forgot he was at the Army and he was yes, at the Navy. He left, that us. A while. <laughs> he, he left you, but he's taken that, uh, he's taken his blueprint over there to uh, his friends over at the Navy, your friends over at the Navy. 
and Elam, I think you have a very interesting perspective because this standards game and, and technology innovation, as you were pointing out earlier, you, you all have been, been there a few times now. Where do you see AI as compared to where it is in its journey compared to previous cloud and security and identity and all the other things that you've worked on over the years? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, at, at least it's a, uh, uh, in terms of the field, it's a, a multidisciplinary field of uh, 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 mathematicians, statisticians, computer scientists, but also uh, psychologists, uh, cognitive scientists, lawyers, and, and that by itself bring a new challenge because you get different uh, perspectives, this different uh, even in terms of the terminology and vocabulary, each of these disciplines have uh, their own uh, comfort zone with uh, how to express a problem and how to go after a problem. And so, in, in that sense, it's a uh, it's a much uh, broader uh, broader uh, topic. And then also uh, similar to the other one, there is there is a foundational and there is a application part to that. Uh, so there's questions about the uh, a foundational research to you know understanding the limits and capability of the AI, understanding how to do the measurements for AI, understanding what are the risks to AI, how to understand them, how to measure them, how to mitigate them, uh, uh, evaluations and all this. Uh, but there is also AI for science or AI as a tool to advance science. And as I said, this has a very broad por portfolio of re research and our scientists across the laboratories uh, are using uh, AI and machine learning uh, to gain a deeper understanding of an insight into their own research, as well as to better understand how AI capabilities and limitations, what are the AI capabilities and limitations. Um, the, the, the research areas that uh, our scientists at Crossness are using uh, are medical imaging, smart manufacturing, spectral measurement, material design. And in terms of standard, um, so, uh, there is a, a set of a sort of foundational standards or horizontal standard as they as they uh, in the standard lingo they use it uh, and that is standards that are uh, technology agnostic use case agnostic uh, and they are useful and helpful and they are needed but also as we call it vertical standards so we can have some sort of uh, standards in uh, application or what bias means generally regardless of the a technology or a use case, uh, but we also need to define bias for uh, uh, you know the different applications, because how it manifests itself in healthcare applications versus autonomous vehicle versus, for example, face recognition could be different. And um, so there is this aspect of a multidisciplinary uh, that we need to draw and bring everybody around the table and and uh, everybody's uh, voice needs to be heard, and also this. Uh, uh, cross tech, uh, technology horizontal versus different applications. I'm going to pop a, a question on you. Do, do we need an AI center for excellence for the federal government, kind of like what you guys have set up with MITRE on the NCCOE? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, first of all, we are working very closely with uh, NCCOE on uh, our secure projects uh, is uh, a collaboration with MITRE at NCCOE. Uh, we put a terminology and taxonomy for adversarial machine, lear uh, machine learning out, and we are right now building a testbed for evaluations of vulnerability of AI. So there is there is a lot on the intersections of the cybersecurity and AI that NCCOE can do, and we are certainly leveraging that. Um, in terms of uh, the need for uh, broader collaborations and engagement, uh, definitely uh, uh, AI is one of those fields that uh, we do need collaboration. And as, as you know, we started the series of the workshop, bringing public, uh, private uh, sector, uh, uh, national, and international experts and leaders together on uh, uh, figuring out, you know, uh, AI risk, uh, uh, trustworthy AI, uh, and uh, so. Uh, and the better ways of having uh, the, the engagement, uh, national, international engagement, is absolutely key. And however we can do it better would be better. Would be Fantastic. Helpful. Fantastic. And uh, Ryan, uh, what uh, you make your way as you make your way across the federal government? What are some trends in what you've seen at government agencies? Uh, yeah, I mean a lot of the trends that we're seeing are really, you know, when I saw the poll results, I was just 
you know, I wasn't terribly surprised. Like, yep, that's that's kind of in line with what I expected. You know, there's kind of a low edge engagement right now, but a very high artificial intelligence engagement right now. Um, everybody's, you know, most organizations have started their AI journeys, um, but not many have started their edge journeys um, in any kind of like, you know, modernized, organized fashion. Um, but there's a lot of interest in edge. And I think that was kind of what we saw reflected in the polls. Um, and, you know, to kind of um, hit on what Janice was saying about, you know, we've, you know, we as a people have uh, started using AI to reduce the cost of our scientific analysis. Um, you know, really edge has that same kind of philosophy of, you know, now we're not just wanting to reduce the cost of our analysis, but, you know, reduce the cost of our data. If we, as we're streaming in data, if all of that data has to hit my data center and get analyzed centrally, um, that take that that's expensive, both in money and in time. And, you know, as you know, working in the public sector, our goal is to get the best analysis out and the best results out as fast as possible to make intelligent decisions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if we can have an intelligent edge that is able to filter through that data and say, you know, here's the data that's most important, or, you know, you know, if I'm analyzing a hurricane, here's where I need to fly my airplane to gather the most important data. Um, if we can have that done at the edge and then streamed in, that, you know, gives us a lot better results on our scientific analysis. Um, and really, uh, you know, the, and I think that's kind of as the data science methods in government continue to expand and continue to become more formalized. I think that's kind of the next frontier is like, okay, now let's get more intelligent about the data, where it's coming from and how I'm getting it. Um, so I think that's, that's really what I'm saying. And I think that's going to be the next, you know, six months to a year is going to be those discussions. Yep. And uh, Jeff, you want to add to that? Well, I think, you know, I think everybody's kind of hit on some of the themes and I, I wasn't surprised by the poll results either, especially the low uptake on edge processing, right? Because we know how much sensor data, even the NOAA example, right? Just tons of data, right? Whether that, you know, comes from systems of record or commercial sources, right? Um, you know, I'd say the other thing that I've learned when, I'm, when I've talked to, you know, I, I specialize mostly in the Army and the Air Force kind of, uh, you know, tip of the spear kind of people, Sometimes they overlook COT solutions. So the other thing I wanted to, to bring out is, is that there's a lot of companies, and I'm not talking like AI startup companies, I'm talking more, you know, people that have been around a while and, and, and doing things that are solving hard problems from a COT solution. I was uh, with SOC Europe, Special Operations Command Europe last summer, and I, we were talking about doing signal intelligence at the edge and, you know, a coder, right? You know, Python, our guy was getting ready to write some code and I, went to a website and I said, hey, this company's already done it. And he's like, oh, great. I don't, you know, but he was all prepared to, to, to start womb to tomb on, on, on coding up that solution. So the other thing is, is you know, let, make sure you do the due diligence, right? Is what you want to exploit from a data standpoint, make sure you understand the data, but also see what's already out there. Because um, I'm seeing a lot of great solutions that are you know, customizable where you don't have to start, you know, from ground zero, especially in this container web, uh, you know, cloud enabled uh, world that we live in. No, I agree, Jeff, and, and HR's been involved with the Jake on this project that I won't get into any details on, but it's, it's like, how do we adopt a commercial technology? A lot of these solutions are already built. How do I get them adapted for the federal government? And just, it's the speed of utilization and getting them start to use them rather than building something from scratch, which is, you know, you're never going to be able to comp duplicate what the, what the commercial market is in most cases. Right. Um, Matt? Uh, yeah, that was actually a perfect tee up. Uh, what, what Jeff just said, I was, I was going to hammer in the same point. Um, not just specific to the government, but something that we're seeing trending uh, among multiple different industries, specifically financial um, and then as well as telco, obviously, if, if you're talking about edge computing, you, you have to talk about telco. Um, with 5G, that's, that's been our whole pitch, right? Is that, you know, you guys are spending so much money on this purpose-built hardware that's super monolithic, meant to do one task. Uh, well, with GPUs, what we specialize in is being able to do a lot of different things. Um, and that's been our big push uh, in the telco industry for, towards 5G is that, you know, you can ramp up uh, call data during this time, you can ramp up data 
uh, during this time. And then, you know, even looking down towards the future, there's going to be people with uh, VR streams in their homes and things like that. And being able to already have the hardware there to be able to traverse and accommodate those needs, I think, uh, is, is super important because, you know, when, when you think, when you talk about the costs incurred, um, at the edge, it's, it's rolling trucks and getting folks out there. So the less tweaking you have to do, uh, I think the better. And that's a lot of what, again, what we're partnering with HP and, and Red Hat on to be able to enable solutions like that. Um, the other balance that you have to keep in mind with regard to edge computing is, you know, the, the trade-off between sending data back and leaving it out there. Obviously, security is of, of the utmost importance with the government, so you don't want to have too much sitting out there. Um, that's where, you know, that, that connectivity back. And then also when you're talking about things like uh, real-time voice translation, um, you know, milliseconds matter. So, you know, you, that's, those are, those are when you're weighing the priorities of things that need to sit at the edge versus, you know, your obviously super secure data center. Um, those are the things to, to keep in mind. Matt, you're definitely teeing up ATARC. We've got a 5G lab concept that in our 5G working group. And uh, next week, Idaho National Labs has a very big 5G conference for the government. Very exciting developments. It's gonna ch change the way we do business and, and uh, good stuff. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, almost like yeah, we synced up. Yeah, we synced up. It's like almost like we had a prep call or something. Yeah. Um, actually, we didn't even talk about that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I learned as much on these webinars as the audience, I think. Uh, we've got a question that that I that strangely enough on a webinar we didn't really address so much. Um, had the effects of uh, COVID and working remote affected any advances in development ability in the field fields of AI? How how is this? Uh, all everybody on this has been on down the road of AI. How has COVID in, COVID impacted? Negative, the same. Um, how, how has that worked on? And and maybe we'll start off with. Uh, you, Venu. I, I know we talked about it this summer at one at a webinar. Now we've had eight nine months. How how has uh, COVID affected your mission? Right. So COVID, um, what I have seen here within NIH is uh, we are going virtual in many areas, and especially for invoicing. That is, um, we had some paper based. Now it's hundred percent virtual. And I can um, give you my example here. We used to conduct hands on training uh, in class. And now we are 100% virtual and it is immense successful. Now we are like, we have unlimited seats. We have users, they are training, uh, they are getting trained. So that is one of the examples and another is the invoicing. So, um, and then in other areas where we, uh, we were, you know, outreach programs, uh, reaching out to industry and all that. So that is also all virtual. And it's very effective and you will see a lot more attendance that in virtual sessions than in um in person so um that uh, those are major changes and um everyone is very effectively working from home it's um we feel like it's a more collaborative uh, um a work environment, but uh, I'm not sure, I'm not aware of any new people if they're getting on board, how they, you know, they don't get that time of um, talk, you know, talking in hallways or getting to know people. So that's where I feel like we need to work on I, um, and come up with innovative areas or innovative ways to explore that area. Otherwise, and it's going really well. And I think that our agency has dealt really fairly well with COVID. That's ironic. The office is getting more work done not being in the office. That's, uh, that is that's pretty good. Uh, Christos, you, you uh, I mean, not only are you, uh, you guys are dispersed now, you are you have a bunch of doctors and, and how do they uh, deliver care in, in a COVID environment, some of the challenges there? Yeah, well, within the within the NI, um, we were actually doing uh, some remote work even before the pandemic. And uh, because, I mean, for those that don't know, uh, this was uh, designed and, and really developed back in uh, December of 2019. So our team initially began kind of small. Now, within the broader VA and across the different VA medical centers, there's inherently some services that require being in person. 
Um, but a lot of the research, a lot of the, the strategy, a lot of um, the, the uh, yeah, I, I'd say there, there's certain services that require contact and then there's a lot of other services, especially within the emerging knowledge economy that just don't require uh, contact, just require collaborative tools. So uh, within the NI, we've, we haven't had any challenges uh, pivoting to that fully uh, kind of remote uh, work, work uh, environment, um, and in certain instances, we do uh, make, make a uh, make a point of going out in person and meeting with certain uh, uh, clinicians, like at the DCVA, um, which, which is local to to me, to Gil, uh, to some of the other folks on our team. Um, but uh, yeah, I think every organization needs to think about, and this, this I, th I think this concept of doing a human capital inventory where you say, who is our end user? Uh, what, do, what are the different inputs to uh, deliver that value? And then, uh, and then once you know those different tasks, some tasks are gonna be, you can do it on a computer and other tasks you maybe need to do in person. Um, and once you do that inventory as an organization, you can kind of step back and say, okay, like what's our game plan for, um, uh, we might not be able to do it all remote now. Maybe we can do that in the next year and you develop a timeline. Great, great. I, I'm gonna, I could ask everybody that, but I'm going to go ahead and move to the next question. Um, really on, it, on your edge strategy, what kind of operational issues should you be concerned while building an edge strategy? You know, what are the elements? Uh, why don't, Christos, you want to maybe talk a little bit about that since we had you on? Yeah, well, uh, I, I'd say one needs to think about uh, in, in an organization, there's there's lots of different departments, there's a lot of different uh, ways that data uh, it can be ingested into the into the broader organizational effort. And so on one hand, you, you don't want to have it so easily accessible so that like literally every person can just go to a single uh, point. I mean, there, there's maybe security reasons why you might not want to have that. Um, but you also don't want to have each silo operating with their own different data set that can't talk with one another because some of the biggest advantages to AI only happen when you can link data sets together. So for example, in order to predict mental health, you don't want to just have medical record data. You also want to be able to link it up with uh, employment data. You want to be able to link it up with um, uh, clinician notes from EHRs. And so some of the biggest benefits occur when you are able to combine it together. Now, uh, realistically speaking, uh, these, these agencies and departments, uh, there's things that carry over from year to year. And so it's not always uh, easy to just make that transition. Um, so from the perspective of distributed uh, data and trying to uh, unify it, I mean, that, that's a goal that I mean, every organization needs to continually kind of reevaluate where are we at, um, uh, how, how do we uh, how do we harmonize things a little bit better? And and the VA is actually going through uh, that sort of harmonization right now. Um, and the last thing I would say is like some of the data that we use um, is from something called like the CDW. And so the VA actually has a pretty good way of of harmonizing that already. It doesn't mean like we are trying to improve that, but um, there is there is a decent amount of harmonization because we wouldn't have been able to do what we did with the dashboard if we didn't. And we're just able to get all this data from the different medical centers and um, use a pretty big sample. It's, it's not as if each medical center has a different way. No, they have some standards and uh, we're, we're really thankful that they, they adhere to uh, all those standards and we're trying to always improve it. Great, and uh, I'm gonna go back to the industry uh, folks. Uh, Matt, what would you, help uh, when you're helping government agencies, what are you helping them as far as operational issues, issues they should be concerned? Well, I mean, like I said, a lot of what we're doing um, with not just the government, but kind of industry wide is helping people along their journey. Um, you know, I, I can make it sound really simple <laughs> that you can just pull down a container and, and get started on a model. But, uh, th you know, the reality is there's a lot of work that needs to be done behind the scenes. Uh, a lot of folks are bringing their own applications. Uh, I've been an engineer in the federal government. I understand some of these applications and they're not, you know, kind of the most uh, current, um, you know, a, a lot of legacy dependencies, things like that. Um, so writing in a container is, you know, easier on paper than in actuality sometimes. And a lot of people building this infrastructure don't know about these old, uh, hidden applications in, in uh, government basements and things like that. So, um, you know, writing those things, getting Helm charts ready. Um, a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, 
and, and then, you know, all the while uh, having to navigate certain policies and things like that, um, it, it's certainly no easy task. So, um, you know, we're, we're, help, we're here to help, you know, again, we have tons of data sci scientists. We, um, we enjoy complex problems and, you know, um, I wouldn't say, I, I've seen many, um, I, I would say that that's probably one of the most common trends that I see is, is just, you know, putting, putting pen to paper and, and getting things uh, easily portable and easily deployable um, so that, you know, you can operate in, in the flexible manner, which, which we um, try to promote. Great. Uh, Jeff, Ryan, anything more to add? Go ahead. Go ahead, Ryan. Sure. Um, yeah, so a lot of the challenges, you know, I, I agree with what Christoph was saying. It's, um, you know, you got to have this kind of like, you know, ubiquitous access to data that's in some kind of secure fashion, and you have to be able to collaborate on that somehow. Um, but you also have to have, um, you know, e equally as important as you start going out to the edge is you need to be, have some way of wrangling in, you know, all of the hardware and all the compute resources and all of the every resources that, you know, your scientists and computer scientists have to operate on. Um, and that gets, you know, really tricky when you're starting to look at thousands of sites and, you know, what software do I have deployed at different sites and who needs to use what. Um, and that's really at Red Hat what we've been looking to simplify with our, you know, Kubernetes layer um, is how do we make a, basically a resource access model that allows people to get the distributed resources they need that will also work on that legacy software um, that Matt was talking about that, you know, not everything is a container, not everything's going to be a container. Um, and so how do we support those workloads that are also, you know, not, you know, I hate to say not modern because it makes them sound bad. You know, not everything deserves modernization. Some things, you know, some things are, I, I like to call them classic instead of legacy. Um, but <laughs> I'm going to steal that one, Ryan. That's go a good one. It. It's a classic yeah, I, system. I, I probably stole it too. So, you know, share and share alike. And we're open classic COBOL. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, how do you support these classic workloads that are, you know, the way they are for, you know, probably reasons. Um and that's really the, the infrastructure that we're, we've been looking to build with uh, OpenShift. Great. Jeff, real quick, do you have anything you want to add to the conversation? Uh, just quickly, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I think the, the people like myself that live in, in the, the platform world, you know, and, and like Matt, you know, we kind of know what is the order of the possible. And I would encourage everybody to think about experimentation, right? It's okay to fail, right? It's okay to press the envelope because the, the technology enablers that we're talking about today are all here, right? And I see a lot of, you know, ooh, you know, what if it doesn't work? Well, you know, it's gonna work, right? It, it might take a few tries to get there, but the technology is absolutely here today and, and let's, let's go, you know, make it uh, do what we need it to do, right? Yep, yep. And my, my last question is, and everybody's knee deep in all this work, say about two years from now, you know, it's gonna be, 2022 and uh, we're headed to 2023. I can't even imagine that right now, but where are we going to be? Where's your agency going to be? Where, where are agencies generally speaking going to be? And uh, we'll, we'll end it on that. How about you, Vinu? Put you on the spot first. Yes, uh, actually I'm looking for a bright future here and I'm pushing myself to our agency to uh, you know, I have classic system here of what uh, Ryan mentioned. It's not a legacy, it's classic now. So um, getting away from those systems or um, infrastructure and leveraging these technologies to improve these systems. And um, I think so our agency right now, we have a few initiatives going on and there's another data sharing policy that came out of NIH uh, that would also kick in. And that would be a major change in NIH environment to share data. And that would entail not only data analytics, but uh, our AI, that how we leverage that data and uh, biases that we need to control um, to put that policy. So uh, I'm looking towards a bright future here and definitely in, um, collaborating with industry. Kristen, where are, you, where are you working for in this talent acquisition? Especially, we're going to need more and more and more as the as we age out uh, a lot of veterans, so to speak. So I think we're we're looking at a number of different types of talent in this workspace. One is your you know 
I, I won't call it traditional data talent because we know it changes by the time we write the duty description for it. Um, so we're going to need that, but we're also going to need a greater level of data fluency throughout the entirety of our army. We need leaders who can speak data and who can communicate their decisions that they need to automate. We need um, people working in between or people working and running the product teams, data teams, to who understand the way that the army thinks and how to integrate these systems. And I think we are moving in that direction. We have a lot of leaders who have put a lot of emphasis on it. They're looking at career progression. They're looking at promotion opportunities. They're looking at the ability to gain greater flexibility on the platforms we use and the hardware that we use, which all of us are excited about. Um, but all of this is kind of, all of this is for nothing if we don't get a handle on some of the, I think it's just the painfully unsexy part of what we do, and that's the quality data. I mean, nobody wants to go through and talk about how we go through and revamp our processes to actually collect data and, and um, transmit and share data so that it maintains some type of quality. We have a lot of data and we're parsing through it with a lot of these different projects. It's not always the best and everybody gets in there and changes it up. You know, as, as data scientists, we like to get in there and everybody has their own transforms that they want to do and everybody has their own way of cleaning it. And then we develop it into systems that all of a sudden it's not compatible and has to be retransformed to how this other system processes it. So we have to get a handle on our foundations. And I think if we put some investment in that, um, everybody wants to get, get to AI, but we really have to get to the data so then we can figure out how to lay these platforms over or how to lay these, uh, the COTS products over them so that they can be used effectively without all the modifications that we end up doing. If we can wrangle that problem, then I think we're going to really make some advances. Great, great. And uh, Christos? One of the things that I think we're really looking forward to uh, over the next year is building, well, so I mean, we started out kind of as a smaller team. And so one is just uh, bringing more people into, um, into, into our community. Um, but we're also excited to write more CRADAs, um, write more agreements that help us, uh, I mean, give us the, kind of the legal grounding to be able to work with the university, uh, work with a, a company um, to be able to share and de-identify data. Um, that's probably going to be the biggest lever because we really don't want to duplicate efforts that are already being done by, by, by my phenomenal colleagues on, on the panel here. Um, what we want to be able to advance is, uh, one, what new data does the VA have that other people don't have, like the medical records? And two, how do we help coordinate? So I'm, I'm just really excited to kind of get these new research vehicles um, that will allow us to to actually operationalize the data that we, we've kind of got sitting there, but isn't always um, yeah. uh, being used. I'd love to chat with you more about that. I, the UL, the one you did with UL on cybersecurity is fantastic. I think that you should leverage that creative capability. That's a great, 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 great idea. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, Jamise, what are we going to have? What, what's going to be on my app that's going to be weather-wise? You know, I've got my apps on my watch now. I've got, uh, and you guys are doing such a great job. Where are we going to be in two years? I can't wait. So in two years, we are actually looking to have established the NOAA Center for uh, Artificial Intelligence, okay. and that will allow us to, um, you know, further facilitate, um, you know, creating these these applications and um, advancing AI across the agency, as well as, as all have mentioned, expanding partnerships. Um, you know, what that means for us is, of course, producing even more accurate forecast. Um, you know, we are in a historical hurricane season, and we're really seeing how our models and prediction tools um, have advanced and allowed us to provide, you know, the, the accurate forecasts that are needed for people to take action. And that's our ultimate goal, you know, to make sure that not just from the weather side, but also when we talk about what we're doing um, with blue economy and, and, and ocean, you know, we want to make sure that our data is, is accurate and that people are trusting it and taking action to save lives and property. And so with the use of AI, um, we will certainly advance even farther in that area. Thank you. Um, and Elam, uh, standards, uh, I, I love what you're talking about. You know, AI ethics is going to be a big, big motivator and, and a big, big issue. And we, we, we actually have an, a, an AI ethics uh, project team right now. But I'm really interested to see where you think this uh, standards uh, are going to go and with artificial intelligence. 
First, I'm hoping that in two years from now we have vaccine and testing everybody so the COVID is over. Uh, uh, but on the AI, yes, I'm hoping that by then uh, we have made uh, uh, big strides and progress toward building the scientific foundations, understanding uh, issues uh, and have a shared understanding of, for example, what bias means in AI, how ex what is ex expectations of explainable AI uh, and, and metrics and measurement to do that. Uh, these, uh, if, we, if we have this, if we know what constitutes trustworthy AI, if we have a good taxonomy for risk, if we know uh, uh, how to uh, define them, if we, then we know what it is that we want to measure, we can move on on development of the metrics for measurement and development of standards, tools, guides around this, and uh, embark on development of a risk management approach for AI, similar to what we have done for cybersecurity, privacy, and other risk management approach. So um, a, a lot of um, hopeful for the, the next two years uh, for the uh, uh, excitements and uh, activities in AI. Thank you for that. Uh, Ryan? Hey, yeah, so um, I think I'm gonna answer a slight variation on the question you asked, uh, just to be okay. difficult. Um, I think, you know, where, I, you know, I'd like to focus on where we're going to be with AI in two years as a, a species and not necessarily as, you know, a um, individual organization. But, you know, I think, you know, if we look even two, four years ago, uh, deep learning was in reinforcement learning, kind of brand new topics that we didn't, we hadn't really mastered yet. And now if you want to do a deep learning model, you can do that rather trivially, um, thanks to a lot of great work that a lot of you know, really sharp people have done. Um, I think the next two years, you know, um, I think we'll see edge, uh, you know, kind of be solidified. People kind of know where they want to use it, know where they don't. Um, I think everyone will have a relatively mature, you know, AI practice, but I think the academia that's going to be coming out around that time will be more, will have a better understanding of, you know, the dynamics of an AI system. So instead of looking at these things as individual data points on individual inferences, like understand the dynamics of my model and how it changes and how that affects things like bias and allow us to, instead of just asking our model, what's your answer to this question, we can ask the model, you know, what's your answer to this question and why? And we can start deriving more human intelligence out of these AI models that we've developed that, uh, you know, and just develop more human insight into what they're, those, these models are telling us rather than individual, you know, data points. Thank you, Ryan. And Jeff? Um, you know, it's, far, it's kind of hard to imagine. I just did an industry talk um, just not too long ago about the history of edge computing. And if you think about like the first real use of edge computing, which was the Apollo guidance computer, right? They solved a problem that was space constrained, no pun intended, right? And had a, a small power envelope, like 50 watts. And in the, the relative compute, you know, our smartphones just, you know, blow that away, right? So you can only imagine in two years, just the way we're going by using different accelerators from NVIDIA and others of enabling these models that everybody on this panel is trying to solve. I, I just think, you know, it's hard to imagine, right? So just, I just, you know, that are the possible, like, it's just going to be great to see how it progresses in solving things like COVID and the humanitarian aid and all the different things that we can help with AI. It's going to be super to watch. And I think to your point, this mission of the federal government, this isn't something we're going to be 10 years behind, like other things we've been. It's, we could be here right now. Uh, I, I think it was uh, Elham, you know, be coming up with a, a vaccine. That's a lot of AI involved with that, uh, you know, and, and speeding that whole process up uh, with with all this compute power that we have now. And Matt, I'm going to give you the last word. All right. Um, yeah, no I think so. Or you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like all the answers uh, previously, but um, you know, I, I think the biggest one that we're going to see, uh, and, and certainly the most apparent uh, to all of us as, as uh, citizens is, is going to be the autonomous driving. Um, and certainly a lot of the stuff that, that we're kind of focusing on is, um, is, is in that industry. We've, we've signed some uh, big agreements with almost all major manufacturers um, in, in building uh, autonomous vehicles and things like that. But really the underlying technology that's enabling that is the connectivity. 
um, and when you talk about 5G and, and you know, generations to come after that, um, it, it's really that, that that makes all these things possible. And um, this industry trend, AI speaking, um, has, has really aged in dog years. I mean, I, I've never seen anything um, in this industry grow so quickly, so um, or so much so quickly. Um, you know, I was kind of on the forefront of uh, of hypervisors and uh, with VMware, and then kind of new on the container side. And you know, as you mentioned, Tom, there was very slow adoption in the government for these technologies. It was basically until mandates were made and said you had to do it. Um, but with AI, everybody seems to be forward leading. Everybody seems to. Uh, at least to some extent, understand the value here and, and be reaching forward. So I, I think a lot of those things are the reason why we see the quick adoption and uh, the quick grow in the space. Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for the federal government to be the lead. We've, we've always, in World War II, the federal government led the, led the world in, in technology development. I, I don't know if we have to develop all the technology, but we have the, the greatest use cases for the American people inside of the federal government. And we have access to this incredible technology to deliver services to our citizens better. And I think that uh, I'm really excited about artificial intelligence and I'm really excited about the things that we can do together, working together as industry, government, and academia to really, uh, you know, really help America uh, be in a good place, you know, with our citizens providing health care and, and, and benefits and, and these kinds of things. So great stuff. I enjoyed the conversation. We went a little over time. Thank you all for sticking with us. Um, I want to thank the, our partners at Kerasoft, Red Hat, HPE, and NVIDIA. And um, next week we are, <laughs> it's an, I, I, you know, you do these things, you don't even realize what you have coming up next sometimes, but we are talking about expanding mobile to the edge and 5G. And, um, you know, that's going to be very exciting. We've got a good group of folks that have been, been with us for a while uh, that are really talking about uh, 5G and where the federal government's going. So fantastic uh, lineup next week. And uh, everybody have a great uh, Veterans Day. And for all the veterans out there, we appreciate your service. And uh, we'll see you next week.